much do you really know William Wallace? Like, do you even know if he was really Scottish? It might not be as simple as you think. So if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. For some of you, everything you know about William Wallace comes from the documentary Braveheart. A few will have a more in-depth knowledge and of course there will be those who think they have an in-depth knowledge but the point is that I want to dig into the roots of William Wallace and shake the tree at the same time. How Scottish was he? Or for that matter, the people around about him. You see, I recently made a video about the motivation, funding and construction of the National Wallace Monument above us on the Abbey Craig near Stirling. I called it what they don't say about the Wallace Monument and I think that would hold a few surprises for you as well. Now, in the comments section of that video, one of those people who know everything pointed out that Wallace was born in Wales and spoke French. I pointed out that I didn't think that either of those two things were quite true. Now the chap seemed to want to get into a debate that I knew I didn't have time for, but I did think it was an interesting topic about which to make a separate video. Actually, another guy commented in the same video that wasn't William Wallace of Britain? Now, for our international viewers, I should probably point out the subtext to this. The fact that the Wallace was a Britain guy's avatar picture was a union flag suggests to me that he was probably trying to make a current day political point about everyone on this island being British rather than genuinely asking a question about whether William Wallace was Scottish or maybe it was just he supported the Rangers. It's a football team. To be fair, a football team has done really well considering how recently they were established. Enthusiasts on both sides of the Scottish independence debate will tend to skew historical events and figures to justify their own political stance 700 years later. Now, in another world, I would have asked you to say whether you're pro-union or independence in the comments section, but I'm desperate to avoid this channel becoming a slagging match for current day politics, so let's just move on. If you live in one of those foreign countries, you've probably got your own debate in folk who do similar things. Few of us are immune. Although, I've been vaccinated. Shit, don't upset the anti-vaxxers! Now that I think of it, the Welsh French commentator, remember him? He might have been making the same political point with a bit more subtlety. Although I suspect his motivation may have been a bit more self-indulgent than political. I'm not entirely 100% sure. And either way, 700 years after we're dead, nobody's going to be talking about our little spat anyway. So let's leave aside the politics. I thought it would be interesting to try to unravel all this for people like you and me. First things first, the name Wallace does come from the Norman French Wallace, which in turn came from an old English word Wallish, that literally meant foreigner. Isn't that kind of ironic that the Anglo-Saxon immigrants were calling the folk who'd been here before foreigners? Although, I suppose, if you were Saxon, the Britons were foreign to you. The point is that when the Romans left, the Anglo-Saxon folk had come across what we call the North Sea and the language and culture of Britons diminished in the eastern part of this island, leaving the original Brythonic language and culture in the west, or Wales, peopled by the Wallish. Now these Wallish didn't necessarily have to live in what we'd call Wales. It really just meant that they spoke that Brythonic Celtic language that we now call Welsh. Indeed, hundreds of years after the Saxons came the Normans in 1066, when the Anglo-Saxon word Wallish was replaced by the Norman Wallace. So, 
our first correspondent's confident assertion that William Wallace must have been born in Wales. Of course, his dad, being a minor Norman knight, they must have spoken French, because the Normans were French, weren't they? So the Wallace family were immigrants from Wales that gained a little bit of land in Ayrshire through service to the Stuarts. In fact, historian Andrew Fisher argues that Ricardus Wallensis, Richard the Welshman, was the progenitor of the Scottish Wallaces. He came in the service of Walter Fitzalan, first High Steward of Scotland. That was around 1150. If that's true, Richard the Welshman could have been an actual Welsh-speaking Welshman. Or it may be that he and his family were Anglo-Normans from the Fitzalan states in the Welsh-English border marches. You see, this Norman nobleman Fitzalan had been given lands in Shropshire by Henry I, the son of William the Conqueror. Fitzalan's dad had come over as part of the invasion with Henry's dad. Now, here's the thing though. Fitzalan's dad wasn't a Norman. He was a Breton from Brittany in France. He may have spoken French, but would certainly have spoken the Brythonic Celtic Breton language. Is that a bit like Welsh? Yes, it is. So it's not entirely surprising that this Breton would be placed along the Welsh border. He would be better able to understand those Britons surviving from Britannia. Are you getting that? The Welsh are what's left of the Britons in Britain, and the Bretons are what's left of the Bretons in France. So, if you're going to put a man on the border with the Britons, best make sure he's a Breton. I'm glad we got that cleared up. Of course, when David I of Scotland brought Walter Fitzalan north, Fitzalan brought Richard the Welshman. But his descendant, William Wallace, wouldn't be born for more than a hundred years. He wasn't born in Wales, he was born in Scotland. But there's another way to think about this. You see, Scotland hadn't always looked like this. Why, when David I, a bosom buddy of Henry I of England, brought William Fitzalan, the Breton, north, did he give him lands in Ayrshire in the west of Scotland? Now, if you watched my video about the people who made Scotland that focused on the Britons, then you'll know that the people from the Clyde South were the people incorporated into Scotland from the Britons who'd survived from the Kingdom of Alclute, then the Kingdom of Strathclyde. In fact, when the Normans arrived in 1066, the Kingdom of Strathclyde, Cumbria for pedants, had only recently been subsumed into Scotland. And these people may still have been known as the Strathclyde Welsh. So David I had given this Breton, Walter Fitzalan, the job of keeping Scottish Welsh in hand, just as Henry I had required him to do south of the border. So you see, William Wallace may have been a descendant of Richard the Welshman, who'd come north with Fitzalan, but he could equally have been from one of the indigenous Strathclyde Welsh who'd been here all along. Depending on which of these two stories you believe, his recent ancestors may have adopted Norman French, or they may have adopted the other Celtic tongue of Gaelic. You see, in that melting pot that we call Ayrshire, I'm sure there would have been folks who saw their heritage as Welsh Strathclyde Britons, mixed in with those who saw their heritage as Scots Gaels. Others were the new Norman imports, and sprinkled in amongst them, might have been those who looked back to Breton France, or indeed, Anglic Northumbria. And remember, Wallace was born just after the Battle of Largs brought the West and Western Isles under the control of Scotland rather than Norway. I dare say, you might even have found a few who saw themselves as Norse, even although the Norse Gaul Gael spoke Gaelic by then. And in a time when medieval feudalism met Celtic kinship groups, I'm sure huge swathes of people would see feudal 
or family ties is more important than national identity. Every week, I have people comment on these videos saying I'm African and can't be Scots. Either because they're too stupid to realise that the two aren't mutually exclusive, or they've made a willful choice. Being born Scottish doesn't stop me being Guinean. Having Guinean ancestry doesn't stop me being Scottish. Now, these people think they're insulting me. To them, being African is an insult, but being Scottish isn't. It never occurs to them that there are millions of people like me who are proud of their African heritage. And there are a group of Egypts who think calling somebody Scottish is an insult. Edward Longshank's mob. Personally, I'm happy to have two passports and a single identity, as are huge swathes of the world. But this isn't about me. It's about William Wallace. I'm just saying that he may not have seen his identity in the simplistic way that our two correspondents or viewers of Braveheart did. He was born in Scotland, but even if he had been born in Wales, that wouldn't stop him being Scottish, owing allegiance to the Scottish Crown. If he was Welsh by dint of being a Strathclyde Briton, that doesn't make him Union Jack flying British. There was no such thing. Now, before the Raj bams in the politicosphere head for their keyboards, if you are Welsh, I'm happy for you. If you're Breton, enjoy your cheese. If you're British, then fill your boots. They'll probably smell the same as the Breton cheese. None of these things are inherently bad. That's not my point. Did William Wallace speak French? I'm sure he did. In the same way that my relatives up in Buchan speak English. Aye, fit like quine, did you like your owie fine? That's how they speak. There's a reason that the TV programme Trollerman comes with subtitles. There's a reason that I have to adapt my speech for these videos. And even then, people still want subtitles. William Wallace probably did speak a very specific dialect of French that would be recognisable here 200 years after the Normans, who didn't speak Parisian French, had branched out from Normandy. He probably also spoke some combination of Gaelic, Welsh or English, depending on who he was speaking to. You can label William Wallace however you want. You can put whatever language in his mouth that pleases you. But deeds speak louder than words. And when you look at his actions here at Stirling Bridge 700 years ago, he seems to have been pretty Scottish to me. If you want to know more about Wallace and other folks who took up that struggle with him, then there's another video coming up on screen now. In the meantime, Hammy and Dawkins can be a lamb alley. Cheerio and drastic.